All right, I motion that we call the meeting to order. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. <clears throat> PTO, what? Um, principal's update. Okay, so I've given you a copy. So we're going to look at the dashboard first. Um, so a couple of things. Our attendance looks really, really good. We're above the state charter goal for the month of, oh, this should be October, not, not September up here. Um, where it says FY20 September, that should be October. Okay. Um, so 96, almost 96.5%. And I put the staff retention back up and put percent of staff who were offered a position and accepted. So that makes sense. Um, RTI, we're going, so we, last month I broke the RTI data down, academic versus behavior. We, your academic pyramid should be small at the younger grades and get bigger as you go up. Um, we are top heavy, we're upside down, so we have actually pulled in the specials teachers to start. So with the RTI process, the response intervention, every student in the building is a tier one student. Um, when you start having academic or behavioral, behavioral concerns, you uh, schedule a meeting and they move to tier two and you put interventions in place and they do what's called progress monitoring. And then you meet to see if those interventions are working. If they're not, you can try new interventions or you can move to tier three. Tier three is where you do um, progress monitoring more frequently, usually weekly, and you put some more interventions in place and then you meet after so many weeks and decide, are these interventions working? If not, you can possibly look at um, testing for individualized educational plan or an IEP for special ed. We have a lot of students in tier three for kindergarten through third. So we have actually pulled in specials teachers and starting this week because they have a little more planning time than your gen ed teachers do. They will be going in and doing the progress monitoring for their specified students on Wednesdays and they will be going in three days a week to work with those students on interventions. So we're hoping that will help um, kind of get this RTI where it needs to be. And hopefully, more importantly, just help our students in general, especially those that need uh, more intense instruction and interventions. So, and that is basically like the highlights of the dashboard. What's our current uh, staffing at? How many positions do we have? Um, that we will talk about. It's on the um, so last that's, slide. Oh, the 40 out of 41, that's the positions that we offer. That's not our current. That's for this school year. That's not gotcha. the current. Yeah, but we will get to that, Todd, on the last slide. Okay. All right, so then um, CCRPI is really some exciting news. Um, so what I did was the next slide shows you 2018 compared to 2019, um, our overall district score, and then we get a score for elementary and we get a score for middle school. So the state has really, um, they've been a little confused by the CCRPI information because in the state of Georgia, there's been a huge rise in milestone scores, which plays a big part into your CCRPI data. And the graduation, graduation, graduation rates are going up for high school. But so they were expecting um, the governor and everybody was and Richard Woods was expecting that, hey, this, you know, CCRPI scores are going to look really good for most schools. That is not what happened. A lot of the CCRPI scores dropped, especially at the middle school level. Thank goodness we didn't follow that pot pattern. We increased. So we went up quite a bit in the overall district score. We are now considered a C school. So up to seven through 79 is a C school. So 80 is B. Last year we were a D school. So 79.8, they don't give us the, they're not rounding up. They don't round, no, they don't round no. up. So we're technically considered a C school, but it's good that we've moved from D to C. Yes, and 
then actually, um, state charter-wise, our scores are one of the highest for the charter schools that it, that is governed by state charter. So that's pretty exciting. If you go to the next page, so for elementary and middle school, there's four components um, that they get this, your overall score. There's content mastery, which counts as uh, 30 points. Progress counts as 35 points. Closing the gaps is 10 points, and readiness is 20 points. So you can see Liberty Tech scores compared to the state score, and then beside each, so for under content mastery, you have English, language, arts, and math, which is for third through eighth graders. You have science and social studies that is only for fifth and eighth graders. Um, under progress, they only look at English, language, arts, and math. They do not consider science and social studies. We did have a drop under progress in the elementary math by 7.3 points. Um, Closing the gaps is what gets a lot of schools. Um, our Liberty Tech score was 62 and a half, but we increased by 54.2 points. So even though the score is not great, our increase is, was great, was actually amazing. So we, that is an area for elementary that we need to work on with the closing the gaps because the state score is 73.8. Um, interestingly enough, it actually breaks the data down into subgroups, and our white students were flagged for math and um, science under this area. Um, English and language arts, as well as math, were flagged for economically disadvantaged. That's where our um, red flags came up. And then readiness, um, our score looks good, but literacy is an area that we need to work on which literacy is a thing that really gets a lot um, of schools. So that's an area we want to focus on here. Student attendance looks good. Beyond the core is foreign, it's a foreign language, it's um, um, visual arts, um, things like that. So that's what is under beyond the core. Any questions under elementary? Uh, beyond the core, that's, we got, tore up last time on that because of the scheduling issue, right? That was the issue where the additional period that we had where we had all of the language arts and everything wasn't reflecting. Was that, that I was think so. It was they only took the first six periods. They only took the first six and it was seven. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Was, so we adjusted yeah. that. And yes. And then, yeah. Okay. So we scored 100 on Beyond the Core for elementary. That's a, that's a great mm -hmm. improvement. Yeah, I mean, it looks really, we still have room for growth. I did go to a CCRPI training session last week at the Georgia State Principals um, Center, and the gentleman that led it, Bobby Smith, was amazing, but he said a lot of times when your scores improve greatly, you have to really watch it, because it is, you know, because what they do is they set a target score for you in different yeah. areas, and if, you know, it's hard you to find. Grow by Correct. 100% they expect 100%. 3% on top. That's yeah, correct. So that's awful. one area we just have to watch really closely. Um, middle school looked pretty well. It's still pretty well. Pretty good. So content mastery, we were above the state level. We did drop in science and social studies under content mastery. Um, progress, we were above the state. English and math, I love, look at the math growth at the middle school level. We increased by 19, a little over 19 points, or 19%. Um, closing the gaps, look at the state score for middle school, which is where closing the gaps is what did a lot of middle schools in. And we scored at 64% and increased by 14%. An area for improvement here, science and social studies for all our students was a red flag, and then math for economically disadvantaged and students with disabilities. Um, and then readiness, our score did increase by a tenth, um, but we were still above the state score. Literacy, again, is an area um, for improvement that we really want to focus on, and then beyond the core was, we dropped 1.22%. Um, one of the things we are working on, the admin team and I is working on, is we are going to come up, every um, staff member is going to be on a school team and one of the teams that they can choose from is a literacy team 
So this is going to be teachers that are very passionate about lexile levels and um, just literacy in general. So that's one area that we're hoping to really work on that literacy. Any questions on literacy? So we have never really dove into CCRPI as a school um, and going to that seminar last week like it was just like a revelation for me. So one of our committees, one of our teams is going to be data and so when we get map data they're going to dive into the map data because some teachers data is their thing, some mm -hmm. teachers don't have a passion for that. Mm -hmm. So this data team is going to break down CCRPI into just tiny little pieces and then we're going to they're going to deliver it to the staff because obviously I think if you walked through and picked five teachers tomorrow to talk to them about CCRPI I would tell you that probably maybe one out of five would understand other than it's just basically our grade kind of like on a report card. Correct. So I wouldn't expect the teachers to have to understand it but I'm just looking for how these results translate into actions that are measured through targets, right? So how do they look at this and say, okay, well, here's our action plan we're gonna do out of it. We're gonna focus on these areas, we're gonna maintain these areas. And then our goal is to get whatever, right? So you can measure whatever your efforts. Right. So it's kind of like the, um, I know last year there was like sort of a school plan of, and, mm -hmm. and it was broken into a lot of these areas and some of them targeted a lot of the things that touched on CCRPI. Now I know that um, you know, part of our model was that you know, we didn't want to be a school whose sole focus and purpose was Test. testing right, and right. CCRPIs, but you do want to encourage the type of growth and right. the type of learning that translates well into this. So I, I, I'm, the only thing that I can think of that I recall that really had sort of targets and you know, these are the actions that we're going to take to get better in these areas was the, the, that, school, improvement the school improvement plan. Yeah. Which I have that. I don't know. I don't think I've ever shared that with you guys. So Mike and I sat together and the, um, the goals that we met last year, we I tweaked and changed the goals that attendance was a goal we did not meet last year. Um, so we've targeted some different things through that, but then we still, we now have a, we had an upper school math lab last year. We have that as well as an upper school reading lab. Um, so since I just got all this, since I really know how to dig into this data now, I had an admin team meeting on Friday. Mm -hmm. And so this past Friday, so that's what we're gonna do is really dig in so that they can understand it and we can figure out specific target areas and things to do. Yeah. Um, also, as the map data comes in, um, I will be meeting with the teachers that run the two upper school labs um, and we'll just be putting different things in place as far and looking to update the school improvement plan for different targets. Yeah. And I would fully believe that, you know, these scores are the result of a well-run organization, uh -huh. um, but should we be the goal? I mean, we can all see that the outcome of the process, right. but not the focus of the process. Right. So if you would be have a well-rounded education model, these will be good. Right. Um, and so our I model. Want, that is one of my comments. It seemed like I was expecting. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Uh, and our model of who we are and what we say we do yeah, yeah. should should produce results like this. Yeah, and if there's a school program again, that would be something I would well, want to do. What we should really do, I mean, because if this coming Friday, if we're getting together to lay out our vision, I mean, I think once we work on that vision, it would probably be really healthy to grab that school improvement plan and say, all right, does our improvement plan achieve our vision are, are those lined up um, because yeah I mean maybe maybe when we revision maybe we don't want to work on those things anymore maybe we want to go somewhere different or or maybe we well, I hope we'll find is that yeah everything's all lined up you know the things that we're already working towards on the improvement plan line up well with our vision the one thing I was going to ask because um, it was helpful in trying to get perspective um, I think last year when they sent out the CCRPI data, they also sent out all the school, all the scores for all of the state charter schools. Did we see that lineup of where everybody else hit? 
I have not seen that now. You can go. Um, it's sent to Lake out in this high school. Yeah, it's there. I was going to say, it's, it's, yeah. oh yeah, maybe yeah, it is yeah, there. It's, yeah. I was going to say the one thing that I, and when Mike Stewart and I had a conversation, um, we were talking about some of the different charter schools, but I don't know. I maybe looked at that. It's, it's in the charter school newsletter, and then you can also just go to the charter school website and you can plug in, like, like you can plug in and compare to a different school. So it's the same one link from last year, but they did include it in the, mm -hmm. one of the weekly newsletters. Okay. And then the school improvement plan, Mr. Tua did share that with the board and then you can meet in the cafeteria last year. Okay, yeah, I just read it. I just read my supplement. Yeah. See that, Eric, where you're at is the state. So that's yeah, the Georgia to. DOE, that's the state website. That's not from state charter, that's from um, just Georgia DOE. And you can go and look at any school in the state of Georgia. Right. And, but it doesn't give you a comparison. It just gives you all the breakdown for. Mm -hmm. sure. It's in the email that came from Lauren Holcomb from the state charter schools to all school board leaders, and then and then I forward it to everyone. Yeah, I think you got it. So it's a link. It's a thing in there. I don't see the link in her. It's green. Um, no, she underlined it and put it in green, but it's not actually hydraulic. No, go down where it says Georgia Department of Education release group. We can look at it after the meeting because it's not like yeah. Yeah. one video. Because I can start, I'll look for it while you guys Because yeah. that was, I mean, I, I want to say that last year, I think the highest score that anybody got was like an 86 or an 87 or something. So the highest I've seen is um, Coweta. No, the museum school was that around. I mean, like statewide. I saw one that was in the 80s. Well, state Coweta Charter, who was governed were, by, they were 85. And they were top dog last year. But even yeah. Fayette County was 89.5, yeah. I believe. So we're, I mean, we're moving on up, which is what we just need to continue to do. Um, when I was at the conference last week, there were several other charter schools, and their overall scores were 50s and 60s. <laughs> So that, so when you click on the link that's in the email, it says right here, if you can download this spreadsheet, that's the overall rating. If you click there, it, open, it downloads an Excel sheet, and then you can filter by school and it has the ratings there. So this is this is what the one I forwarded from Lauren Holcomb. Okay. Okay. Um, the next slide. So, um, the committee that just met talked about this. We're really excited about this high school options fair. Um, so on the night of December 3rd, which is the big winter extravaganza concert uh, that Mr. Pafford is heading up with the band and the chorus, the different choruses, um, I met with Ms. McKelvey and she was asking me, hey, we do this for our eighth graders. What night should we do this? And so I said, well, we had a really good turnout for the winter extravaganza last year. So let's do it the same night and get as many families do all this stuff in one night. So December 3rd from five to six in the Commons area um, will be um, the high school options fair. So we have confirmations from Landmark Christian, uh, the Forest School, which is with Pinewood, uh, Our Lady of Mercy Catholic High School, she wants to attend but has a small conflict that she's trying to rearrange her schedule so that she can come. Um, we didn't really focus on the school systems because last year Aaron said one, a counselor from the um, main um, office came with um, Fayette County but she was not overly helpful. So we're just trying to, uh, she's reached out to Trinity, she's waiting on confirmation from several of the different high schools. This is mainly for eighth graders, but any, any family in the school can come. Um, I think, did she reach out to the foundry too? Yes. I was gonna say, I think she did. Um, Cause I know I was talking to some eighth graders actually this morning and they're looking at the foundry. Um, any questions on that? So that's gonna be a big night, so. Uh, one of the comments I was aware that five to six might be too tight. Um, so Part, or at least be looking for documentation 
for people to pick up because it'd be hard for people to get to get here at five. Yeah, mm -hmm. because I think Mr. Piper said even the market shuts down at six because they do want everybody in, the room. in there. But we are also having book fair that week too, yeah. so that's the late night for the book fair. So it's going to be. But the book fair, I need to talk to them because they want to stay up until seven, mm -hmm. which will take out. people out of. It seems like you guys have a lot of um, things going on with those time slots where it's start stop, start stop, start stop, which to me sounds like a lot of chaos. Um, so if you just even make them, and then people when the band starts, they'll go and they'll sit and they'll listen to watch the band and make it happen. So that's so we put time slots like this last year, but we did leave it open. So yeah. like. We're not having someone standing there saying you can't go to the book fair, you must go to the concert. Right. We're right. just announcing, hey, here's the key time, here's the time for those opportunities right. to start, where someone's going to be manning that event. Right. So, and it worked out fine last year. I mean, we had a very good crowd um, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it was. But with just so many counties represented, I told Aaron it's just difficult to do all these different evenings. And expect all these families to yeah, come yeah. back. Yeah, consolidation is great. And I think it's like I think it's a great idea. The more we consolidate in a few nights, and then just try to yes create sections. Yes. Um, Absolutely. At different points in the school, far far from each other. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, and the last thing for me is just a quick personnel update. We did hire a new Spanish teacher. Her name is uh, Mrs. Dawn Galubeth. We call her Miss G. Um, she has four years of teaching K through five. Um, Spanish and two years of experience teaching at the high school level Spanish one. So she um, has started and is settling in very nicely. What's the what's the onboarding process for I don't know a new Spanish teacher we know nothing about? Like how do we how do you make sure she's organized on target? Spanish is actually legit. Well, we did um, have Sheldon McGee come into the interview process because he speaks very fluent Spanish um, and speak to her. Um, normally, just normally the process is a little more lengthy, but due to the fact that we needed somebody a little bit quicker than later, and we had several applicants apply for this, um, but he came in and spoke some Spanish with her, and then um, I, the admin team sat in there with me, and we just kind of rate the candidates and then they give us references and things like that. I was thinking more like day one on, so not, not the hiring process, more like she started <coughs> a couple weeks ago. How do we make sure that she understands? She's like on board. Yes. She's on board. So she, she met, she, any new hire meets with their dean. Mm -hmm. um, so her first day she met with her dean. The dean kind of goes through policies and procedures. And then any new staff member this year has been assigned a mentor. Mm -hmm. So her mentor is Leslie Robinson, um, who just kind of checks in, sees how things are going, does she need anything? Um, and then I've been checking in with her just to see how things are going. Um, so really the dean's the big one and the mentor's the big one. So the, the, the dean or mentor, like are they on you know, increased observe observation schedules they're on a full plan so they will have four walkthroughs and two formatives for the year okay yes and the deans check lesson plans the deans um monitor and jody smith is her dean mm -hmm. so jody jody does a really good job and what's that like the feedback process of like is it we great assessments monthly assessments how do they get that feedback going back to the parents it's coming back to um, feedback about so like lesson plans if there's something missing then the dean will communicate or if something if it doesn't you know if there if it doesn't look like it needs to then Jody will communicate that with her um, we're documenting through um, you can comment in her lesson plans like we can actually go into their lesson plans and comment and they can answer back yeah. um, we're just doing a lot of documentation just um, even just some Google notes and stuff like that um, but she's uh, she just started two two weeks ago three weeks ago. Yeah, well, it's one of those things. Think you know, whereas uh, maybe when in any situation, right? With any teacher, you try the best that you can. But such a small school, like every cultural impact could be huge. So yes. just ensuring that they're you know ramping up, they're comfortable, they're succeeding, they feel part of the culture, they're maintaining that. It's all so critical. So make sure 
Absolutely. Take a touch on that. Yeah, and we'll talk more in executive session about stuff like that too. Um, we currently are looking for a lunch specialist. Ms. Janet resigned. She found a new position uh, with the Fayette County Sheriff's Department. So um, we, I'm interviewing tomorrow for that. We, the IT specialist, it looks like we're gonna go with a part-timer and then outsourcing with the company. Um, I'm still in the uh, Scott Gallagher has some really good options for businesses. So Tyler and I are meeting with him, um, hopefully Wednesday morning to look at that. Um, so we have candidates coming this week for that. So we're hoping to get that because we've got a lot of um, IT issues starting to surface. Um, and the last thing, Celeste McGee and Jennifer Mullinex, uh, they won't be here the next two days. They have to, um, they're attending the Carl Vinson Institute um, for the Charter Schools Financial Management Certification Program, and it's 12 hours, so they will do their first two days this week. Um, it's six different days, and then every two years they have to renew their certification. Um, and that's the personnel update. So I, I guess before we end, Principal, I just have one additional question. Maybe this was more appropriate on the dashboard conversation, but as far as, um, I don't know if it's just anecdotal, but it, it feels like there's been a little bit of a departure of students over the last couple of weeks. And I don't know if, do we have a feel like, as you, I assume you do exit interviews with those families as they're leaving, like is there a common thread that is driving some of that? Um, the most recent families we've lost, um, they, the three families all left for different reasons. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm just, want to make sure we don't have a systematic thing where we're seeing over and a over lot again, of something right. common. Are we, are we tracking like the reasons why? Reason? When they have a, when they get the withdrawal form, they actually put on there why they're leaving. Mm -hmm. um, but then I've had a conversation with two, the, the three that we just recently are lost are like, one family today was their last day, and then one family Friday's their last day. Um, two of the three, I have had conversations with parents just to kind of figure out, you know, why, what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, one of our office staff had a conversation with the other family that was leaving and reported back to me. With the, with those um, withdrawals, I know we have a large waiting list. Those are about, I mean, they'll be pretty much immediately mm -hmm. gone. Yeah, we have a fifth grader that um, we gave a school, I gave a school tour to um, last week, was it Friday? Um, they're, they're getting ready to go out of town. It's a child that's been homeschooled all the child's life. And um, so they have until December 2nd to make a decision um, on that. Is there any way you could um, aggregate and anonymize some of the feedback that we provide? Sure. To the district? I mean, it would be interesting to see the yeah. I mean, I think, I think scatter plot of be aware of trends. Like, hey, I noticed that you know X percent are moving away. So whatever the case is, X percent are right. switching right. here, switching there. Yeah, I can absolutely do that. Um, and if you do any sort of percentage breakdown, do it by family, not by child. Yeah, that's a good
convoluted, <laughs> but um, a lot of the funding that we could potentially have available will be based on maximizing those segments. I'm going, I think it's next Wednesday, to Griffin Lisa to spend a day with the Georgia DOE mm -hmm. um, because I received an email about that a couple of weeks ago, and they're um, it's quite interesting at times working with the DOE. Um, state charter is very organized. They're like, we need this, 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 this is yeah. how you do it, here's the directions. Uh, state DOE is not so much like that, so I'm going for, it's like a half a day seminar um, that I signed up for, and I'm going down there just to get more information and okay. the more I can learn, the better. Better for yeah. me. <laughs> better for me. You're talking about the funding allocation? Yeah. they're going to need and that would determine the type of funding that we would then get so to give um, during the summer test student on you know kindergarten before we onboard them so I can reach out to the parents to see if we can get some more information on how that funding works because I'm not familiar with that at all I mean, I mean yeah. if they're doing it some school has to have the sample mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. until like what that October is when the data is collected right that's October's FTE, October yeah. and March. You gotta have everything in and organized mm -hmm. by then. But I'm like, then I guess we start because we start so early mm -hmm. in July. <laughs> uh, you, <laughs> have, you have quite a bit of funding, but we and I know coding, well and <laughs> coding and coding in infinite campus is very important. Neva, our new registrar, yes. in December is going to a two-day workshop, and I may go with her depending on the two days. I need to look at my schedule. But it's a two-day workshop done by Infinite Campus that she will be attending, just for her. You know, since she's new at that position, um, and I may try to go with her because that's where your funding. If you code something wrong in Infinite mm -hmm. Campus, yes. I do know that it it can, it can be disastrous. Yeah. Yes. Right. Sure. Yes, I did get the email from. It was Terrence at the SES event, right? Mm -hmm. That was the one session, but it was also. I believe the principal or dean from another school in Clayton mm -hmm. County that oh, was yeah. um, very familiar with the second thing. I got his email, so I can reach out. Oh, please do. Yeah. Um, Cobb County does it too, and I know they test the kindergartners, but they have like a little like where they come in and they they to get them accustomed to school. So they do that. I know Cobb County gets on my call too. Um, hmm. Did that kind of like we did the Wow Week. Mm -hmm. Our very yes. Sure we so they use that time to test the younger students. So I know schools in Georgia do. Right, right. We can just maybe reach out and get some more info from them. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. And Todd correctly pointed out that we jumped over the public comment. So okay. is there technically is there any yeah. it was the domino effect made it down here. Thank you, for, thank you for keeping me on the notification of our annual start date. <laughs> yes, there you go. The dig there was on. Yeah. Um, all right. There weren't any <laughs> Do we have any public comment? There weren't any. All right. Um, academic committee. So, did you want to talk through teacher reviews, Mrs. King? And then the one thing I kind of wanted to talk about is I, I know you sent out the uh, the plan with respect to how we handle the high school credit classes, and I just wanted to make sure that's we're all so we are um did i send you guys you did okay the schedule so i was um sharon and sharon brooks and i have been talking about scheduling a december meeting with the parents um to give them that information and give just give show them an example of what the letter looks like and how they can have the option to accept the credit or not um but, and it may look like at that time, some parents may want their student to not take the EOC, which right. would look like a possible changing of schedules with That's Infinite right. Campus. I just have to see what that looks like on our end of things with the state. Um, because what I have learned is that they cannot opt out of the EOC. That is, uh, that is on the state website. Um, and speaking to my advisor with State Charter, 
Um, she said basically what I had discovered through the state DOE, if they, um, they can accept the credit or not, if they take the class and they take, they have to take the EOC, but then they say, we don't want the credit. In high school as a ninth grader, they um, are not able to retake the EOC. Now it happens and it happens all the time. So it's like I told Sharon, we just need to communicate on our end what we have to do, because then when they move to the other counties and we will communicate the fact that they're not supposed to take retake the EOC as a ninth grader. And actually Katie Manthe said with a state charter that if they even sit through the class again and take try to take and they take the EOC, they're supposed to get a zero average in the class. I just wanted to, you know, because I've, I, since I'll be in that December meeting. That's correct. <laughs> um, I, I have put a lot of sort of thought. So I think a couple questions that I know families are going to have. Um, yeah, so let's say they are in the class, they take the EOC, everything's hunky dory, they accept the credit. How does that appear on their high school transcript? So does it actually, is it a letter grade on their high school transcript or is it a, yes, they took this class, no, they didn't take this class? It's gonna be on their transcript, whether they accept the credit or not. If they, if they pass, then, or the credit is, the unit, the Carnegie unit is accepted, it will, look, it will have a one. So if it's they, either a yes or no on Correct. The, so it's if not, they it doesn't factor into the credit, their, it's a zero. It doesn't factor into their high school GPA. Right. It, it's just on a transcript, yep, in eighth grade, they got a one or a zero. And if they do, actually, I take that back, because if they do retake the class as a high schooler, they're supposed to take, because EOCs yeah, yeah, yeah. count 20% of right. their overall so grade. That's 20%. They're that's supposed good. to take that 20%, and it's supposed to be averaged in with their coursework as a ninth grader. So the, I guess the one challenge that I still have around this is, you know, as, as a state charter school, we get lots of disadvantages. You know, we're financially disadvantaged, we're resource disadvantaged, you know, we're staff, fewer staff, you know, I mean, there's lots of disadvantages we accept. And the reason we accept those is for one reason, and that is that we get additional flexibility we get the ability to think outside the box and be creative so that we're not stuck dealing with things that don't make sense. And when I look at this situation, if I'm just being you know, painfully honest, yeah. I say, it looks to me like all the other middle schools have worked around this problem and they've come with a workaround. And, and I, I like and I respect the fact that, look, we're looking at the letter of the law here, but. I have to wonder if all that additional flexibility we have can't can't solve this problem. I mean, can we make a class that's not called that's ninth what? grade right. algebra? Well, can we be, make a right. preparatory for ninth grade math class that teaches the same stuff? And I mean, like, if we don't Which use this flexibility, right. like, what the heck are we giving all this stuff up for? Like, <laughs> we got it. We got to dive deep into that flexibility pool. And so that's my challenge. Is, I have a hard time thinking that we can't come up with a new, different class or some some structure because what I don't want to see happen and what I'm afraid of is there are going to be some families and you know we're, we're still trying to figure out where we're going to break in all this but you know I can see a temptation for people to say hey you know what I'm scared I don't know that I fully trust because Liberty Tech is still building horsepower and muscle around middle school math. We're getting a lot better. I've seen huge improvements, but like, am I really ready to trust that they're going to teach this material that then they're going to have to build on for all their other years? So I'm not entirely sure we're there yet. So my only other option then is to go stick them back into eighth grade math, which by the way is the exact same class that they took last year. So they all learn nothing this year and they're just going to sit there and stare at a wall. Like that's that's devastating to think that people are going to make that choice because they don't feel they have an option. So I would Well, and even, so here's the kicker for us, and here's what Sarah Beck from State Charter told me. We are not an accredited school, and so Sarah Beck said, technically, because we are not, we don't have accreditation, 
no high school in this state has to accept, they can say, I'm not accepting that credit because we're not accredited. So um, I was talking to, it used to be advanced ed who Mike was going through last year, and I've been talking to them, and then I talked to my advisor, and she said, accreditation is a huge process, and she said, you need to get through this year, and then you need to go for accreditation next year. She said, because get through this year, then you can go for accreditation. But Sarah Beck said, eventually, y'all need to go for accreditation because no high school in this state, no public high school, has to accept your high school credits because you are not accredited. So that's a whole nother like, even way more complicating of this issue. <laughs> and so we're, I mean, like, I feel like we're giving, you know, this is a yes or no, you gotta do it or you don't. Once you're in, there's no getting off, there's no change in your mind, see it all the way through. Well, by the way, schools may or may not accept it. You may not be allowed to retake the, I mean, it's just like, oh my gosh. What it's a, a lot. What so a terrible situation. Fayette County gives you the option, gives the, op the parents, because what I did, I took Fayette County's form and I took another county's form, the county that my advisor's child went through, and I took those two school forms. And in Fayette County's, theirs was a very vague, yes, I accept it, no, I don't. Whereas the one that I got from um, my advisor, it was more detailed and very explanatory as to this is what's happening, this is what you're doing. So that's the one I took and tweaked and made it for us. So that's what Ms. Brooks was saying, maybe when we meet with the parents, because we know this is going to be a concern, we say, okay, this class, if these parents say, yes, I want them to take the EOC, well, they stay in Allen for one. If these parents say, no, 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 this is freaking me out, then we kind of change, and I don't know if that looks like leaving them all in the same class, I don't really know how that works yet, and yeah, changing, class, like okay, setting up names. This happened to me at the exact same time. They in the same location. Amen. That's exactly. Right. But that's the yeah, type right. of flexibility we should be afforded because we've given up so much for that silly flexibility. But my only concern is because on FTE, one of those things is student class. And so the state, when you're trying to sign off on student class, they're real picky. They're real picky. So my concern is if we do that, then the state's going to go, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, 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 you had Algebra 1, now all of a sudden, halfway in the year, you're popping in. So that's where I've got to figure out with the, that's what Sharon and I are trying to talk about. Like where, what does that look like? And is the state gonna come and say, wait a minute, what are y'all doing? So that's, that's what I need to find out. Because that's what Sharon said. She said, maybe we should just create, she said, I know that would be a lot of work on your end going in and creating, it really wouldn't. I'm just, I don't want state to ding us and go, wait, what happened? So I don't know if it's just, we need to get through this year, take the credit or not, and then next year for Accelerated really look, you know, how does that, because this year we're doing what Fayette County has been doing since my youngest, who is 25, was at Whitewater Middle. In sixth grade math, you do six, and half of seventh. In seventh grade math, you do the other half of seventh and all of eighth. And then in eighth grade math, you do algebra one. My child did six and half of seventh. The teacher said, no, she needs to, um, no, then she went to seventh and did the other half of seventh and eighth. And then that teacher said, no, 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 you don't need to go to algebra one. So she sat through in eighth grade, the same class she just sat through. And then that teacher said, wait a minute, where are you doing this in this class? You need to be over there. <laughs> So it's just like at that point, it's like, you know what? Just roll with it, let's go, let's get out, let's move on to high school. So it's like. I, I don't ever want a family to feel like they need to have their kid go retake eighth grade because they don't want to play this high stakes poker game that we're right. trying to set up here. So, so uh, there's definitely, that's why Sharon and I really, need, and I need to sit down with Ms. Burns as well, and really, because in Spanish one, they don't take a state EOC. It is created by the Spanish one teacher. Spanish one's not the biggie. It's the physical science and the algebra one. That's where the that's where it really gets a little crazy. But 
but in both of those, again, just for clarity, it's not going to affect high school GPA. It's going to be a one or a zero on a high school transcript. That's what we're. That's what that letter offers. Okay. Now, what what the high schools do with that, we have no control over that because you could. Well, I mean, like when yeah. I when you take AP classes, for example, and on your college transcript. It doesn't, it doesn't factor into your GPA. GPA. It just says, hey, you took right. these AP classes. Right. So now you have the option to go take other right. classes. And it, it gives you credits for it, but it doesn't. Because it's only on the, the yeah. transcript for middle school. And right. so I'm trying to make sure that for high school, it's the same thing. Yep, it'll open up options. Does not impact high school GPA. But it does It does kind of mean that you're probably not going to be taking Algebra 1 again. So you better know that stuff because that ship sailed and you're on trigonometry. And like we had this student last year that is at a high school in Fayette County that had a 89 point something in the class and scored a three, which is proficient on the EOC, but the parents did not want them, they wanted to retake it. Yep. Well, an 89 point something and a three on an EOC? No, you need to send your kid on to the next level. Like, So Ms. Brooks and I were actually talking today and we need to get a December meeting scheduled for those because I think it's about 15 kids that we need to sit down and really have that conversation with because they weren't, you guys weren't given the option. It's just like, hey, this is Accelerate Path, woo! Well, and in fact, <laughs> I think a lot of us thought that the old program, because the old program was take the whole class, you get to the end, Family sits down and decides, like, hey, you know, little little Timmy, I think you struggled a little bit. He's probably take it again. We're not going to do the EOC. We'll do it again. Or no, I think you know, little Susie's knocked it out this year. Let's let's have her take it and let's move on. To the and next that year. you cannot do. Yeah. That is on the state website. You cannot opt out of EOC. Yeah. <laughs> cannot do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to we need to think about ways to because again, I think that's what. Bennett's Mill and Whitewater Middle, and I mean, I think all those schools still get that flexibility, which, you know, we should be the, the nimble ones here, and, um, but, you know, I also don't want to ignore what's clearly called out, but, I don't know, I, well, I just have a hard time believing we can't think through some creative solution that satisfies all the Everybody, and that's moving forward, we really need to put a policy in place for next year's and then meet in the spring with the uprising seventh graders, explain all that to those parents that are looking like they could move that path mm -hmm. and just say, this is what you're looking at. This is a big decision that you and student have to make moving forward. So what do you want to do? At, at the risk of sounding like I'm gaining the system. I mean, it, is it the type of thing that all of those eighth graders that are going down that path could be enrolled in We'll call it ninth grade preparatory, whatever you want. You know, whatever you name that class. And then towards the end of the year, they could then decide if they want to transfer into Algebra 1. And then, you know, once you're in, there's no getting out. You're on the train. Uh, I don't know about that. I'd have to check. That's what I'm saying. I'm already, when Sharon said, maybe what we need to do is for the parents that are really worried about it, create a, a new math class. But I don't... I need to check with the state because I don't want to get deemed by class records when we go in March to do, and they go, hang on, where did this class come from? Like, you're two months, you're, you know, you're almost two trimester, well, trimester and a half in, and boom, all of a sudden you've got this new class. Well, I think we have a pretty clear explanation of what happened. Yeah, what's the, what's the downside of that? Because I think, so, 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 I could pass so the state comes then. back and slaps you on the wrist. What, I mean, really, what's the what is the penalties for that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know because if like we could find out what the options are there, what yeah. the consequences are. We can make a educated educated decision. And what I was told by state charter by Katie Mancy was, uh, they will not go against what the state says. They will not say, oh, we say this and DOE says this. But she said, what whatever school is, school has to have a policy in place moving forward. Like she said, if you don't have a policy in place, that's, y'all need to get a policy in place. So then talking to Ms. Burns and Ms. Brooks, it's just been, you know, we wanna do what's best for the kids. Absolutely. But it's just been one of those, it's been, and when we first started looking into this, 
four different DOE people told us two different things. You know, three said one thing and all of a sudden this one said no. And even the one that's over testing, we had another school systems form and she said, I want to see that form. Yep. That's not right. <laughs> yeah, like, it, it just goes back to, again, my high level concept is if even one student goes through what your child went through where they're retaking eighth grade math, I, we failed that student. I mean, we've wasted a year of their academic growth. We have completely failed that student. So I, I now we just can never get in a situation where a family makes the decision like, okay, we'll just do, do it again because it's what terrible. And we did in Fayette County when my daughter got to middle school, it went based on um, classroom average, milestone scores, I think it was CRCT, CRCT back then. Um, and if a parent just demanded that their kid go the accelerated path, the middle schools had a math assessment that the uprising sixth grader would go in and sit down and take. And if they could not pass that, then the school system said, nope, they're not going in the accelerated path. So, I mean, even if it looks like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. So you're, I mean, I also don't know I want to advocate that all right, you have to make that decision. So at sixth grade, you're saying you're deciding right. whether or not you're taking the ninth grade grant. I mean, like, yeah. Jiminy. But like, think of our sixth graders this year. If they're in the accelerated path, they're going to get this stuck is in what this they're path. doing. They're taking all of six and half of seventh. And then when they get into seventh grade, other half of seventh, all of eighth. Yeah. Yeah. So then as an eighth grader, you're only. It is algebra one, according to the state of Georgia. It that's how this that's how the courses roll. You know, uh, another way is we arm the parents with the documentation in section twenty six of you to go to the high school with. Yeah, they need to be next level up or whatever the case is, right? I mean, I'm sure. I don't know if it's an accreditation issue, but like we will need to arm them whenever we can teach it. Somehow, yes, they've mastered it. Is there a pretest when they go in or something they can take to show they've mastered it to get out of that class? I don't know if it's really about. And so you're saying we don't ever offer a high school math class. We just offer a very advanced eighth grade class and then give parents the option of trying to test yeah. out. Yeah. But we have had students that have moved on to high school and already gone in with Algebra 1 as a credit. Mm -hmm. And we have had students like that yeah, yeah. in the yeah. past. It's a, it's a high school exception. Yeah, but I again, I think we're just trying to think of ways that we don't. So maybe again, maybe we can table it for now. Is yeah, I mean, we double check on what the state options we have. I'm also sensitive the fact that we we can't really table this too long, too long. hardly any longer because you know if families are going to say like, well, no, I I'm not doing that. I mean, those kids have to come out of that class and go into the other. I mean, it's going to it's going to mess up a lot of schedules and all that stuff. But so yeah, I don't know that we can. I'm gonna, let me see what I can find out on as far as the class part of things. Like if we can set up a new math class correct. in the middle of the year, and correct, move and kids not into this and you know have any repercussions. repercussions and it, way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, given the choice between having to deal with a bureaucratic repercussion or fail a student, you know, fail to meet their learning goals. I mean. Because science is not a big deal, because if they don't want them to take the physical science, then they just take eighth grade science. So science is an easy fix. Um, that would just be a, a scheduling nightmare because Ms. Burns couldn't teach physical science and eighth grade science in the same classroom with mm -hmm. the same group of kids. Yep. You know? So science is not as big of an issue. It would just mean a lot of changes in schedule. Um, it's the algebra one that's it's the, it's the math. Probably just a feeling we're better that we can all <laughs> accept it and move on with. We'll all reflect upon it and then move on. Okay. I think that's it for academic committee. Uh, and what about the um, Miss Lee sent out the teacher observation schedule last week from mm -hmm. the two deans, but um, one finished last week, so we weren't able to do that. But then there was one that had some dates for this week. Um, did anyone look at their schedules to see if they were able to? Kenny emailed me and said he'd like to come in December or January. So, 
Um, I need you to pick a day in December because you and I need to sit down for your formative anyway, and so I'd like you to do two reviews at the same time. So, and the first two weeks of December is where that's going to have to be because the last are actually mid year January. Wait till January? Mm -hmm. Hold up into January. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's when we have to do all our mid years. Yeah. But anyway. So maybe January for you? Yeah, I'll do January. Then. So, so everyone do 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 for January. <laughs> so if everyone's doing this in January, then would that that would be the next weekend of scheduling to go to that one? Um, it depends. Some teachers have one big formative, but there's plenty of walkthroughs. They just don't schedule the walkthroughs. They just show up. Mm -hmm. But they can notify me, and then I can say, hey, they're doing walkthroughs. So how about we do this for ourselves, for the teacher observation? We can send out a poll of what dates are, are good, you know, during this date range, and then from there, send that to Ms. King saying, That's probably this person, these are good dates for them, and just do a, like a little chart. And then we can work with that. That's probably good. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. Because their schedules are going to be a little more flexible than your schedules. All right. Uh, development committee, Andrea. Um, so for development committee, we have the second um, Chick fil A student night of the year on Tuesday, October 28th at the Chick fil A Town Center. So we made over $300. Um, our second grade teachers hosted the night, so all the proceeds went to that grade level. So it's Ms. Lewis and Mrs. Um, Ms. Sherrod's class. In addition, Ms. Sherrod's class won the contest for the most students in attendance, um, with, and they'll be winning Chick-fil-A gift cards. Those will be delivered before the break. Um, we had to wait for the testing to finish up. And then the annual fund campaign will kick off tomorrow. Um, so these flyers will be going home with all students in tomorrow's Tuesday folder. The request for participation is $5 per family this year. Um, the participation campaign and golf tournament are both part of our school's overall annual fund campaign. Last year we had an 86% participation rate through this campaign, meaning 86% of our families said they want to support the Retech and their initiatives. Um, the participation rate information can also be used on our grant application to show um, the level of participation our parents have toward um, helping with our initiatives or supporting them. So that's why this is really important. The class with the 100% participation within the first $100 gets a surprise from Mrs. King. She has not decided what that's going to be, whether it's a superhero photo opportunity, a dance, or something. Um, but that first $100 would be by uh, November the 25th. Donations will be taken online under the school giving tab um, through the Tuesday folder check only and also at the front office cash check or credit card can be taken at the front office. And the winning teacher also would receive a $100 supply credit. That means the teacher whose class reaches 100% first after the first $100. And the winning class, one for lower and one for upper, gets a free dress day. Um, the class that raises the most funds, because this is more about participation and not necessarily the amount of money we raise, but we want to give another opportunity for maybe some classes that don't necessarily reach the 100%, but that did also raise a significant amount of money. So the class that raises the most funds, that teacher will receive a $50 supply credit and the class will receive a free dress day, which seems to be popular, especially this time of year, because people want to wear their jeans. <laughs> So a free dress day is uh, pretty popular with the students. So, where does this money go from our perspective? It goes. Last year, it went under in the board bucket for fundraising. So, but it's just. It's, but it went towards other programs. Yeah, dollars. it's right. uncommitted yeah. dollars. Right. So we were able able to use it for other things like say if, for instance, they needed more money to go toward the eighth grade graduation or what we bring something last year? we could support it. Um, last year we raised over two thousand. We mentioned oh, it, but yeah. So, I mean, and, and that was just for this part, not including the golf tournament. And um, we also had, when we had grandparents there last year, we also had 
you're able to receive a good job that day too. So, so people seem to like just showing us that they care and really want to support. Like we said, versus being a voice for like, you know, some schools have where you get different. Yeah, no, like you'll sell candy bars door to door. Or right, something. right. So a required donation. So this isn't more about the money, it's more about getting yeah. them on board and yeah. supporting yeah. them. And that's always the message. I mean, and I see it come through here. I mean, I would I would just say that's that has to be front and center is that we never believe that we're going to fund the school by parent donations. We, we believe we're going to go after grants and that 86% is phenomenal. I mean, that's, that's far and away the best we've ever done. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, if, if the families themselves don't care about it, why should this random third party organization care about it? So, yeah. so we're hoping to beat that this year, be safe with it. So I have a thermometer that um, hang up outside so we can, it, they'll have a visual um, mm -hmm. as we walk through the car line at the front as soon as I figure out how to wrap this one. <laughs> That's all for development. Great, thank you. Uh, finance committee. Okay. Um, we've got the September numbers. Um, everything's pretty consistent with the way it has been. Um, hopefully, now that we've got some new things in place, we'll get a little That's kind of the goal we're working towards. Um, I did review September payrolls. I've got requests out to view various um, checks that were cut for, for that. So trying to, um, I've been able to get a hold of information a little bit easier, so that's been great being able to do that. This past week when we, we were at the uh, board training and I want us to tighten them tighten up some of our documentation that we've got as far as our procedures in the accounting department. Um, look at segregation of duties now that we've had so many changes and make sure that we've got that um, kind of shored up. We need to review credit card policies, things like that, just to know what the spending limits are, signature requirements, that kind of thing. Um, we also need to look as a finance committee at maybe tightening up what we want to look at as far as expenditures. Are there any certain dollar amounts that we want to go through and, and making sure we've got a firm understanding between us and operations as far as that goes. Um, so are we thinking about changing from that? Because currently it's anything over $5,000 that is not an approved mm -hmm. expenditure. Is that still... I think right. that that's fine. I do. We just probably want to address it and just get it out there and make it known. Make sure um, we're hearing. Do you, is that one of the things that you spot check? Is you know, do you look for every yeah, we should, check right? over five thousand and say no? Okay, was mm -hmm. it? You know, like obviously when we see the rent, we're like, okay, that's approved. The Salaries, rent, yes. okay, those are um, approved. So when the boy getting a check is, register is something that just happened in the past two months oh, on okay. a regular basis. But okay, yes, well, I did request that. We're, we're trending the right way. Yes. <laughs> it's less than getting that information. I would like to make a suggestion that you come in and sit down with Celesta and Jennifer mm -hmm. and um, communicate on your end. Because I was talking with Andrea today, I was speaking to Andrea today, and the organization between those two ladies mm -hmm. has been so much better yeah. than the previous two ladies yeah. in that position. Um, and so I think on your end of things, if mm -hmm. you would come in and sit down and even, I can sit in there with Celesta and Jennifer, mm -hmm. and you can communicate to them like exactly what you're looking for, yeah. they can communicate to you, this is what we have, is mm -hmm. this what you're, you know, mm -hmm. this is what you're needing. Mm -hmm. I think that would help on everybody's end yeah. to know exactly what you're looking for, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. And I think that would just help on their end know because, you know, Celesta kind of walked into a mess mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she has done an outstanding job mm -hmm. because all September invoices have been entered into QuickBook, October invoices mm -hmm. have been entered into QuickBook. So we're running very much, you know, she's hoping yeah. that when we present, we're presenting not two months behind. Yeah. So she exactly. has worked very diligently to get to the point. I mean, she has organized and 
Mm -hmm. um, and Jennifer has been, I mean, she's already been changing things and organizing. And so I think that would just help on our end of things, mm -hmm. especially Celesta and Jennifer's know mm -hmm. exactly what, because yeah. I know when Terrence came in with state charter and we mm -hmm. should be getting their reports um, in the next three or four weeks, Sarah Beck emailed me last week and said they're wrapping up mm -hmm. our monitoring letter and it should be coming soon. Um, cash policy, it, it's, there were several finance policies that just need a lot yeah. of correction. Yeah. Yeah, on their end. So you can, Jennifer can give you the information he gave. Mm -hmm. Once we get the monitoring letter, that will give us some more information. Yeah, and I can always give parents a call. I talk with them about getting some of those things tightened up. I do want to sit with them and go through processes because I think we've got, um, with having such a small front office staff that's involved in accounting, their um, internal controls that we need to address just for everybody's safety. It's not right. that we don't trust right. anybody, but we don't want there to be a potential threat if right. someone has pointed at Well, see, and Terrence is the one who came in for the monitoring, yeah. and he said, like, Jennifer's tightened down on the cash policy yeah. because having classroom teachers collect cash is a major yeah. no-no. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so even with the play that we had, all cash had to be walked by the student mm -hmm. to the front office, and there were, Neva and Jennifer were the mm -hmm. only two that touched cash. Mm -hmm. Only two. Yeah. Janet was the only one that touches lunch money. Mm -hmm. So now she's gone until we get her replacement. Neva is the only one that mm -hmm. touches lunch cash. Cash. Yeah. Because yeah. cat and like receipts weren't being written all the time. So Terrence was like, ooh, every time somebody pays cash, you give a receipt. Yeah. So Jennifer can give a lot of information because she took some good notes when Terrence was here. Okay. So the yeah. one thing I want to say from the policy updates that have occurred, if we can get together, whether it be at a separate meeting or something so that we can understand the updates so we can update the large policy back. Yes, because a lot of them came from the board controlled policy book. So as soon as I get all the documentation from State Charter and my notes and Jennifer's notes, I will get, because a lot of it came from that policy manual that I can't, we can't change on no. our end. And right, that's, so that's one thing, thing. thing. yes, right. we, create, right. we create policy on operations side, they do procedures. Mm -hmm. So we have to say, this is the policy, this is the rule, and it's up to you and your staff to say, this is how we execute it. Now, I will step in and say, okay, let's look at the segregation of duties. Who's opening the bank statement versus who writes the check versus who reconciles it? Because it should not be the same person, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so we'll just kind of tighten that up. But yeah, if we have a policy update, that would be us. Mm -hmm. um, which we do need to look at some of that stuff. Um, we did find out that we can do conference calls because we are statewide, so that is good. We can get back to doing some regular meetings. And with that being the case, I would like to suggest that we get someone else on the finance committee besides yeah. me and you. And, <laughs> yeah, so they, and actually, I think Todd is joining the finance committee. Well, when I made that comment, so. <laughs> all right. <laughs> But yeah, that would be great just to have somebody else because and it, we do have a fiduciary responsibility. It's the board's fiduciary responsibility to manage the funds. So ultimately it is on us if something goes awry. And that's an awful lot when it's mainly me. I don't like that. So I would definitely like more eyes, again, for internal control purposes. Um, so that would be good. Um, we also can discuss at a later date or now, but I do think the idea of getting a third party in would be good. Um, I don't believe anybody in the front office has an accounting or finance degree. Is that correct? Okay. And I cannot um, handle any of the day-to-day, -day, of course, all of that advice, whatever is related on their feet, but I would like right, which is why I'd like for you to meet with yeah. them so you can see what they do and then what we really need because yeah. yeah obviously in the proposals that we received a cpa is going to come at a very high cost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if we don't know exactly what we need them to come in and look yeah. at then yeah. we oh, yeah. so that's why i really would like for you to come and sit and meet with the three of us so that we can say oh this is exactly mm -hmm. what we need a cpa to come in and do yeah i think that would because I would love to be able to get to a point where we could get a 
monthly financials because what I get are monthly reports out of QuickBooks, which is a, a watered down system. It's not terribly robust, it does good, but I get a PL that's say 20 pages. A PL should be one page. So if we can get all that data and put it in a usable and format, that's what it's and that's And that if right. she could do that, that's fine. However, um, you know, a CPA that does write up, because this would be a write up engagement, they could mm -hmm. do that. And honestly, it's not going to, we don't use our CPAs for that purpose. So we could even look at a bookkeeper um, that could still do that and do it effectively just a third party if that would be easier. We can all kind of discuss that and see where we want. But at a, at a reasonable price, I say that it would be worth it just because that would be an extra set of external eyes on our book. I would say that I think I'd feel a little more comfortable too if it wasn't maybe annually, right? We had a third party come in, scrub oh, through, mm -hmm. did a budget for that, like it's going to be a uh, annual third party review of all the numbers. But isn't that what the annual what? audit is? Yeah. Well, yes, he no question, do they have it? He does, um, however, being an audit, we are ultimately responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. um, the audit is very <laughs> um, so I don't know how thorough he goes through it, um, and it sounds like a small practice, so I don't know if he hires somebody to do his work. I mean, the state is happy with it, and I'm not seeing any issues with the numbers, but I just... Well, we have something. Yeah. I guess we can get into it and see how thorough we have. We'll make sure we get angry in order, but we'll have some sort of review once that's in place. That would be more of like a, a, a quarterly or monthly write-up to get in there and actually do a little more mm -hmm. on that bookkeeping to look at the detail and tell us, well, okay, we misapplied this or we, you know, need to reclass that. Yeah. yeah I'm sure it's very good. And at the meeting, they did show that we can get from them that example monthly report. So yes, I and I did get the CFO report, and that's one thing that I can hand over to Celesta, that this is something that a lot of it is some of the stuff that we were already getting, like the monthly, um, what do they call it, with the with all of our ratios that we use, that monthly financial report. But then there's um, also some letter, a letter document that goes along with it that summarizes everything rather than us having to go through all those statements. Um, I like seeing the raw data, but it's just as hard to get it together. And, um, Are they still calculating those ratios on a monthly basis? Yes. Okay. And I go behind and I verify them that the calculations that there's no errors in those formulas, that kind of thing. Um, but yes, Terrence sent me a copy of the sample, which we can go over at some point when I meet with them. Um, but that would be good. Um, he highly recommended that, but it was a lot of those ratios with an additional narrative. That is it. We can go into um, more detail on looking at a third party at another point, but I definitely recommend it. So. I did have a governance thing too. Yeah, so um, governance is up next. Okay. Um, so you did receive a governance update once again via email today. So for PK, the new application for 2019 and 2020 still hasn't been posted yet. Um, he's still looking at. Um, the number of pre-K schools that are within the 10 miles of the school. Mm -hmm. So there's still 12 lottery funded pre-K programs um, within 10 mile radius of the school. Last month, he said that there were a total of eight spots open, two at, at Familiar Kids Academy, two at Kids of Kids, and four at Child Care Network. As of today, that number has dropped to a total of five. One at Rivers Edge Elementary and four at Child Care Network. So these numbers play to our favor. For the governance training, um, Todd, uh, Kimmy, Esther, and myself were able to attend last week's training at Callaway Gardens. Most of the material was kind of a refresher from last year, but we each attended different sessions than we attended last year, so it was helpful to us all. Um, Tony and Eric, the next and last opportunity to attend the training would be in February 4th and 5th in Athens, and you need to register by January 2nd. Um, the link for registering was sent out, but we can resend it. Mm -hmm. And then for committee meetings, the um, Esther already mentioned that the, the big announcement that was made at the conference was that anyone that had statewide um, attendance, the people so, class, yes, um, <laughs> right. we didn't I don't know. think that many had the statewide attendance. No, no there aren't. Yeah. There, 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 there yeah. Were, um, we'll be able to add conference calls for committee meetings again. Mm -hmm. 
So um, for our group, we need to, any committees that need to revamp their meeting schedule, if you could please do so between now and the next board meeting so that, and send it to me so that I can update that section on the website as to when your committee meetings are held. That, that fulfills our requirement to post the meeting and mm -hmm. announcement, so that's a big help. And then um, trying to remove process, so I sent out a note about this prior to the last meeting, but we will begin the renewal process next fall. Um, we spoke with um, Kay Nancy at the SESC conference last week. She's gonna send some areas of focus for the renewal process, but the biggest portion of the renewal process is the Comprehensive Performance Framework, or CPF. And so I did forward the notes from the webinar training that Mrs. King and I attended that breaks down all of the changes that they're proposing. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with the financial side of the school, um, a little mm -hmm. less on the academic side. So the things that Esther was suggesting that she, that based on her updates from the conference, um, will be really important for um, the CPF. Mm -hmm. So, and then the other thing they mentioned is that the charter renewal will be done via the online portal. They also gave some guidelines or ideas of things that we should be looking at in terms of determining if we want to revise anything in our charter. I know through these meetings we've mentioned a few things here and there, so we kind of want to bullet point those out prior to next fall so that we'll have those items ready or any research that needs to be done in order to solidify the vision of something, make sure we have all that done before we get to next fall. So, um, and then the mandated reporting and background checks. So last meeting, I gave everybody an update as to where they stood. So if you haven't completed yours, please complete it um, before we go on the Thanksgiving break. Um, I had one person, Todd, turn his other piece in today. So he's checked off. Um, but if anybody else needs help, can get to the link or needs information and let me know. Um, the risk of being ignorant. Do we know? I mean, I, do we just know who needs to do what? I did last week. I handed. I mean, last meeting I handed you a piece of paper and told you what you needed. I have halfway through yeah. mine. I didn't realize it was a two-hour thing <laughs> <laughs> when I started it. So it's really just the speed of the yeah. 1.5. Um, <laughs> right. So Kimmy and I know Todd both went on the same day to get their background check updated, and then so they're done. Todd's just getting his, and then. Um, we did come to an agreement with the front office that the um, the permit, or what do you call that? Guns? No. The, yes, that those were valid okay. um, IDs. I, I found the information for, on the state website where we got it before and I sent that in. I was supposed to send you my certificate of completion for the mandate. Yeah, so if you have it, you can, you can go back and download the PDF and just, you can email it straight to Jennifer Lane. My weapons permit expired. Just copy it, yeah. Okay. You can, uh, if you scan it in, you can send it straight to them. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. You want that to take with that picture? Back that background, background check. check, because they do a background check if you have one right now. Make sure you yeah, leave that on time, too. So. <laughs> but now, of course, you carry it. Sure, you want me to or not? I got to leave. So, so we'll just document that for next year and then remind ourselves what we do and don't do with it. But really, um, the reason we're pushing ourselves to do it is because if we expect everybody else to be compliant, we need to be compliant too. So we can do it however we need to do it to get it done before the break. Okay, thank you. Any questions on items? All right. Um, I motion that we approve the October meeting minutes as emailed around by Andrea. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, so as far as our follow-up meeting, I, I think we talked about this coming Friday. But then two people couldn't make it. Right. Well, this coming Friday? Yeah, on the 15th, two people still couldn't make it, so can you send that Google poll requesting us to check off the date? So he said that December 6th, any time before December 6th did not look good based on everyone. Yeah, he's, he's in yeah. out of the country right now. So is there a way that we can have one or two people do, like is it 
this 80% of our teams write it up and just help them together and do it, or would you guys? Well, we've already done that because we've sent around the suggestions that we collected from the first two meetings because we dedicated our whole board meeting to it at one time. Yeah, we, and then we had the one offsite meeting. So Kenny um, sent out the notes of all of that before. Can we come up with maybe two or three viable choices that we can vote on or tweak and we bring did, uh, with us? Oh, oh, you mean for, for feedback? The, for the like the vision, the vision, yeah. yeah. Stage. Yeah, on. because we got to a point where it was just picking synonyms. Bunch of ideas. Yeah, and yeah, it got a little laborious. Yeah, we were down to the the nitty the minutia there. Yeah. So, so maybe you get everybody. Wait, how long is Kenny out of country for? He's back. Um, I know he's gone Friday. I'm guessing he's back Saturday morning. So like give everybody like you know two weeks to consolidate feedback. Mm -hmm. So I can resend what was sent before up based yeah. on from yeah. the governance committee. Let's start, let's start a new email chain. Yeah, yeah. give everybody two weeks to uh, make feedback and then um, maybe send it to someone we can consolidate and maybe some people are fine with it. Mm -hmm. Last up we're, let's see how big of the alteration we actually need to do in order to feel good. I think we were super close. It was just very yeah, I mean, but specific I words. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you have to but the whole really point was we wanted to wait till the new principals right. came on board so they could have their input. And maybe we do blow it up, and that's, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, we could start from scratch, but I think there's got to be a more effective way. I felt like we got pretty granular with it, and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, in, in a vision statement, I I can see that words are, they are. important. Yeah, and, and I'm not trying to minimalize that at all. So. But I also agree that we don't want to spend three hours talking about you know whether it should be outstanding or excellent. Mm -hmm. Shall or will. <laughs> okay, we'll get there. It's like a mad head, right? I'm kind of our school wants to add to it. So we'll try that, and then maybe it'll be a meeting, but it's a shorter meeting, or okay. do it before the Yeah, if we can do kind of our homework before we get there, I think that would be good. Thought we canceled it last Friday and then we sent no Wednesday and we sent the through the phone. Yeah, he said something about Friday he's been out of out of the country. Mm -hmm. And then we had an event to run to. Mm -hmm. So it was tight anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I motion that we move to executive session. I second. second. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion passes.